You're listening to the Build to Rent Podcast. Build to Rent Podcast. Welcome to the Build to Rent Show. Steve Olson here along with Chase Levitt. Excited to be with you for another episode talking about some of the things that we're seeing in the Build to Rent uh, world. And we had a good episode last time talking about uh, rents and what's happening and the economy and, and what we may continue to see develop here in 2023. Only thing we can guarantee you is that we're wrong. <laughs> Maybe we got some of it right, um, but it's a, it's a tough one to track down. But before we get going into the episode today, remember, uh, please subscribe on Spotify or iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can always go find us at b2rshow.com where you can leave a contact us form or see past episodes. Kevin, if we're not getting the new ones on there, we got to talk about how to do that. Um, maybe we'll talk after. Maybe I should not plan our business while I'm supposed to be doing a podcast. Hasn't stopped me before. Probably won't stop me again. But I said it. So, Chase, how's it going, man? Good. Thanks for popping in. Yeah. Um, we saw this cool article from the National Associate, or well, actually... Realtor.com, Realtor.com, not Realtor. They get mad when you say it like that. That's why I like to say it like that sometimes. So Realtor.com, those who can't afford a single family house are increasingly turning to build to rent communities. So that headline made me think, well, duh, right? But I think the distinction that they're making here is your typical apartment buildings or, or other rental communities are, are getting passed on to a degree for the build to rent communities. And the big thing that they're, they're making, the, the assumption, and I think this is to a degree incorrect, realtor.com, is that build to rent has to be single family detached. It does not. So there's some cool things in the, uh, or just some good points in the article, but they call these horizontal apartments when they're detached structures. And it, in uh, the article makes the point, over the past few decades, 3% of single family starts were developed as rentals. By the third quarter of 2022, that number has jumped to 12%, according to the National Association of Home Builders. So... Wherever you live, you're driving around, you're looking at new starts, which there's not tons of them right now, but uh, a little over one in 10 out of those is a rental, rental property. But most of these are their own communities, correct, Chase? Mm-hmm. So um, this is the the cost of ownership, and, and uh, Robert Dietz, who's the economist of the uh, Home Builders Association, says that we know that as a result of COVID, a lot of people wanted a single family structure. They wanted more space. We estimate that probably about a third of the workforce is working at home at least a few days a week. Goes back to what we talked about on the last episode. All those factors drive demand for the single family structure, but of not, not of course, everyone can afford those, those costs. I mean, that a single family structure is more expensive, right? Yeah. Yeah. You're going to get more for rent. Uh, versus like a condo or an apartment because you have more square footage usually. But it costs you more to put that square footage up. Costs you a lot more, yeah. It's that age-old question of is the lower potential vacancy and maintenance possibly even the better tenant profile? That's arguable. That That's that's uh, too many variables to distill it to that. But does that make up for the higher cost of, of uh, per square foot of building? Don't yeah. know. Yeah, don't know. You just have to weigh it out. If you're the person that knows, please uh, tell us here at the show. We'll, we'll just, talk about it's, you. It's probably just very specific based on the, the city and location. I mean, if you want to do a quick example, is it better to buy a, let's say, a single family home that's 3,000 square feet, maybe a little more? I'm looking at this photo here, and that's what I'm guessing. Let's say it's running, I don't know, 500K, 600K. Let's say 600,000, and you can rent that out for 3000 a month. Yeah. Or is it better to go find a duplex for 600,000 and you're renting out each side for 1500? I maybe, maybe more, maybe less, I don't know. So, yeah. these, things can vary. Just look at the just depends on the area, depends on what single family and the demand is there for rentals of single family. There's pros and cons to both. A lot of people have that theory that at some point you're you're building too nice of a product and even though you might be getting a better tenant with better credit, 
it, it there's no there's no vacancy rate low enough um, or or maintenance level low enough that makes it worth it. And the advantage to not to knock on the single family because single family for rent's great and a lot of people are doing it. Um, but the advantage to having the duplex or more doors, if we're, if we're going back to my example, is if one door's rented and one's vacant, you're fifty percent right. Where let's say that single family home sits vacant for a month, you're hundred percent vacant. Yeah. So it's good to diversify or split up your risk. Right. If you're a mom and pop landlord or you you have kind of a fractured portfolio, meaning there's houses scattered everywhere um, and you have different debt on every single one of those, then what Chase is saying is absolutely correct. But a lot of these, when we talk about build for rent communities, I mean, this is a, you know, there's a hundred houses and a lot of these houses are little cracker boxes, right? Mm-hmm. I, we've seen um, Phoenix was the the birthplace of build build for rent. Almost everybody would agree on that. You know, you, and you look at some of that Christopher Todd or a Villa Home stuff, and a lot of those are little little houses. They're little, but they have <clears throat> what that tenant needs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they have the space that you need. Um, sometimes I think more bigger is not better. I think if you have the, the yeah. right layout that's organized, could work pretty well and be a lot more affordable for that tenant. Well, that's if, if we gave our show's titles, and I don't even know if we do, but the title of this show would be, How Do You Know What to Build? And that's where we were hoping to go with this article because that's, I mean, that's what it comes down to. This article says that um, these type of communities, and we'll, we'll argue this, Feature brand new houses with high quality finishes as well as a garage and a yard. Residents also have access to a fitness center, clubhouse, and on-site management and maintenance in the community. They don't want to be bothered with a lot of this stuff. I was griping to Chase about I'm having some flooding at my house right now. Um, if I was a renter, i just call the landlord and be like, hey, it's flooded. <laughs> and I don't care. Right. But now I'm the home. I'm really stressed about this thing. Why is it flooding? What's going on? We're having like the wettest winter ever in Utah. You think it's the wettest one ever? Yeah, it's been pretty. I mean, I haven't lived here forever. It's as far as Utah County up north. I've been here the last 10 years. But yeah, it's been pretty, pretty wet. Pretty wet. Yeah. Like a lot of soil is settling. You're finding out how good your landscaper was or wasn't <laughs> with your drainage plan and you know, that's something that you'll find out on a build for rent community too. But um, I, I think that we, we've always talked about construction and what do you build and how do you know what to build? But it, it really is economical for a lot of these people. I have looked at the San Antonio market a lot. I've been down a few times. I've tried to make a few things work there. It hasn't happened yet, but they give this example. I'd like to share it with the, the listeners. <laughs> Excuse me. For instance, in San Antonio, Texas, the cost to own a three-bedroom, two-bath house listed at two eighty nine seven hundred, with a five percent down payment on a thirty-year fixed mortgage, along with mortgage insurance and maintenance assumption, is about twenty eight hundred bucks a month. By um, so that and that fluctuates cr- just a crazy amount based on your interest rate. In comparison, AHV communities—they're a, a build for rent. Um, developer in San Antonio, they have a community there that is renting out three bedroom, two and a half duplex homes, Chase, from 2,200 for a 1,365 square foot to 2,400 for a 1,415 square foot a month. Shoot, that makes me look at some of the stuff I was underwriting and go, maybe I was a little low. Yeah. But, I mean, that's a, so you can buy that home for, well, okay, 2,800 bucks. You're the owner. You've got some maintenance, insurance, taxes. Um, you're going to have higher utilities and landscape costs too, most likely. Or you can go rent for at least four hundred dollars cheaper. Yeah, you're about four to six hundred dollars cheaper. So, is what that's telling us or telling me is we have people that are saving their money. They don't want to put down the five percent down yeah. payment. They want to keep that. And they're, they're wanting to rent, which they're paying a little bit lower. It's not going towards them or their equity, right? It's just going to someone else. But they're okay <coughs> with doing that because it's four to $600 cheaper. That's a nice little comparison there that we had in San Antonio, Texas. Yeah. Um, 
And if you if you jump back up, I want to hit this paragraph real quick. Of yeah, why. hit it. Go for it. So unlike an apartment rental, single family rentals and a built to rent community offer the lifestyle of home ownership without the added expenses of maintenance, which we just talked about with mm-hmm. the yards and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Or what some call the hassle of owning a home. The home generally rent for more than a typical apartment. So it's kind of comparing apartments, right, in the single family communities. But it also points out some key factors there that I think the the thing that I want to take away from this paragraph here is it's going to offer the lifestyle of home ownership without the hassle. And I think so many, we live in a, a world of, convenience right Mm -hmm. we have let's not even we'll go down this road doordash right we have we doordash way too much way too much trying to get away from it we have this place called aubergine (laughs) yeah let's just say any any chick-fil-a you doordash the same meal you're going to pay a hundred dollars for it versus if you go get it you're probably gonna pay 40 or 50. so we live in a world of convenience hassle-free and so the thing that I take from this, as you build not just a single family, I know it's talking about that rental community, but if you're looking at building apartment or condo, they're just looking for that lifestyle, and they're also looking for something that's hassle-free. Yeah. So. Two, two comments. Number one, I'm mad at DoorDash right now. I love what they do, but the other day I ordered something. And, uh, you know, I, I'm always trying to dig up sponsors for the show by bagging on companies. That's not a good way to do it. No, nope. it's not. Might That's work. why we have no sponsors on the <laughs> Build to Rent show. Not yet. Not yet. We'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, 50 minutes in, they just text me, yeah, this restaurant canceled your order. I'm like, thanks a lot, morons. I waited 50 minutes and now I got to get in my car anyways. We want that convenience. Yeah. And when it fails, we get really grumpy. Um, so number two Yes, people want the experience of living in the home and they don't want any of the drawbacks. And 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 this build to rent community style of 100 homes with a clubhouse and a pool and a playground and a dog groomer and all that stuff is getting better at delivering that. They're never going to get the principal pay down and the interest rate tax deduction, right? Can't do that. You're a renter. But you can get a lot of the other stuff. I think one of the big ones is the stigma. Uh-huh. People feel like it's you're stigmatized if you're living in a neighborhood and you're you're the one renter or you're one of the two renters. In this build for rent community, we all are, but we all have homes too and we can uh, we're, we're we're like homeowners. Yeah. I think in the build for rent community when those are being built, you're probably going to have the developer that's going to be factoring in that type of tenant versus someone yeah. just owning or living there. Mm-hmm. So there's probably going to be some different amenities or features to that community, if done correctly, that that tenant's looking for. Yeah. Maybe the charge station. Yeah. If you do a gym, like we talked about, you got to do it right. Probably going to have the pool, the clubhouse. Yep. Got to be really smart about what's in that community to see if it makes sense. So when we talk about how do you know what to build, um, I can't remember if it was on this episode or the last one that we did. We were talking about... When you cross the line from doing too nice of a product, right, you're, you're chasing that experience for the tenants. I want them to live in a nice product so they pay me a lot of rent and stay a long time, right? I do know one thing that you and I have identified, and I was up at our project in Heber City, Utah. I'll show you the video after. I was happy to see this. Now, the listeners are going to make fun of me. How do you not know? But we, we weren't sure if our builder was going to do it's called a shaft liner between the units, between these townhome units. And that's a fire code thing, but more importantly, it's a noise thing, right? That means you build a townhome and then you stop, you put in the liner, and then the next townhome. They are attached as opposed to when a unit is uh, fire sprinkled. It has a fire suppression system in it. Your floor and your studs just go straight across and you usually have a two by four or two by six. This is the only thing separating you from that neighbor, and you're going to hear some things you don't want to hear. It's a dark place, okay? <laughs> and and that deteriorates from the experience immensely, right? You get you look at the Google reviews for the community. You look at the tenants. They talk, right? I can hear my neighbor doing everything. 
Yeah. And, 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 and so that's this funny thing where you say, what do I build? There's a fine line yeah. you got to understand from the inside out. I and mean, we were talking about the floor plan layout. Yeah. We're talking about shaft liners, which is important. But then you talk about, well, should we put this nice trim or crown molding in there? No, you're not going to really, is that going to matter? Is the yeah. person going to pay $25 more because it doesn't have crown molding? So just get really specific and understand yeah. each little detail. The crown molding doesn't lead to a better experience or probably any more rent, right, for that money. Yeah. The shaft liner, the thing you don't see when it's done, um, I can tell you now, worth it, right? Because yeah. we say, what are you going to build? So much of that is dictated by the city, right? I, I remember we were doing a lot of d due diligence on a project in North Houston recently, and we were trying to apply many of these lessons that we have learned, you know, I've got some black guys, I'm missing some teeth from Houston. Okay. <laughs> you know that. Yeah. And th that, that's been tough. Well, you learn the rookie mistake is, you know, we're building townhomes in, in Houston and, oh, guess what? If we build so many townhomes in a row, then we have to do a fire suppression system, but we save a lot of cost on the walls between the units. We can get more units in a row Right, because whenever you have that break, now you've got landscape, you've got exterior, right? Freestand, it's the same reason why building detached homes is not as economical as duplexes, right? The, mm -hmm. the extra um, landscape and exteriors and that finish that you have to do. But, oh boy, did we learn. Just because you can build a bunch of the units in a row because they're fire sprinkler doesn't mean you should. Yeah. Um, and, and so, what we remember, we... We designed this community. It was going to be 200 units, and it was all duplexes. Uh, we learned, most notably, what was going to be great, and this project didn't work out. Uh, it turns out there was a lot of issues with the roadway that Harris County was going to require. But I was excited for it because we learned when you're building attached units, we've seen this time and time again. Tenants want the end unit. Leases for 100 bucks more. Got Leases for more longer. windows. Oh, yeah. A little more light. They're going to grab all those. And so we did these stupid buildings that are 12 units in a row cut up into fourplexes. And guess what? There's two end units and then you got 10 middle units. Yeah. Right? Uh -huh. And so what you get for longevity on that uh, is so much less. Add to it the fact that you don't have the shaft liner. Yeah. People feel like they're just living on a cruise ship. People everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's one thing that we learned. And, you know, we go we go to big lengths now to avoid fire suppression at whatever whatever cost we can. Mm -hmm. Like, we'll sacrifice density. And, and a lot of municipalities say if you have, <coughs> excuse me, two or three attached units, you don't have to do a fire suppression system. Those things are expensive. They're high maintenance. They're fussy. I mean, I'm dealing with a situation in Texas right now. Kid threw a firecracker in somebody's garage. The smoke from it lit off the suppression system and the whole friggin' building, right? Floods. And then, yeah, floods things. Then they turn the power off. I mean, it's a mess. Who did it? Whose fault is it? I'd just rather not have fire suppression. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But sometimes your density and the style of your construction, there's no way around it. But I can tell you that... If the economics of the deal are there, we're going to avoid it, right? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, a lot of what we talk about here in this article, I know it really hits home on the single family home bill for rent. And so it just depends on the the area. There is a need for it. Um, is there a need for the condo or the apartment? Yeah. Is there a need for the townhome style? There is. So it's just understanding the layout of it. It says here that, like I talked about here, that they're looking for something that's hassle-free but they also want the same feel. If they're not going to purchase the single family home, they want that same yeah. feel of the yeah. single family home. So what does that tell me? Well, are, they're looking for more space and they're willing to pay for it right now. But is that going to shift? Are we going to see a shift yeah. in the next three to six With to inflation, months? can they pay for it yeah. if they want to? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, so much of this is that art of uh, working the city council, right? Because... What the city is allowing you to build or telling you that they want is not necessarily what the market needs, right? Uh -huh. Exhibit A was our mixed-use discussion yeah. on, on the last episode. 
I mean, the city thinks they want certain things, but they're detached from the realities of being a developer and profit and, and long-term vacancy and, and how all that's impacted. So like working the city council, what do these people want? What are the hot buttons? What product can I design that suits me that is going to get approved by them? Yeah. And I think you and I have worked with some land people that some of them are really good at that. And some of them, what you ultimately get delivered to you, approve, you're going, this is what we've got to work with. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's interesting. I'm doing a deal down in Southern Utah, um, going through entitlements and we're going through the same thing right now where the city in the neighborhood would like bigger or larger density. So, or excuse me, they would like larger lots. So a quarter acre or half acre lots, that's what they would like. But with what the city's actually needing in that area and the surrounding location, it needs more more rentals or it needs more owner occupied on smaller. Um, it just needs more opportunities for people to come in and either buy homes or rent them Yep, is what it needs. So yeah, when you're working with a city, it's good to understand what their agenda is and then help them understand what's what's needed um, show that data and then come to, come to terms on something. Yeah. There's push ground. pull, give and take. You're never going to get everything that you want. There's a lot of push and pull there. Yeah. But you do have to get them to, I mean, you know, when, when you're doing rentals, so many of them just have these dreams of we're going to have these communities and they're so, they're so detached from the reality of what you can do. Mm-hmm. Um, I've noticed the flip side of it too. You know, I've mentioned on this show before I'm working on a deal in the state of Indiana right now. And this is where we bought land from the city for a, a song. We got a five-year tax abatement with it. The city is begging for this rental product. They really, really want it. Um, it's been a lot easier to get them to see our vision and to get them on board. And sometimes we'll hit a bureaucratic wall with the city. And we just go tell on him to the mayor. <laughs> he goes marching over there. This is, we need this. And he figures it out. It's great when they're on your team, but they're not... I would say they're not on your team more often than not. Yeah. I'm uh, starting to dip my big toe into, believe it or not, an affordable housing new construction project in Honolulu, Hawaii. Um, I've got a an acquaintance there that I've trust. We've been talking for years and he's got one coming out of the ground and he's experiencing the same thing. All the politicians there run on, we got to have more affordable house. That's a huge problem. There's only so much land in Hawaii, right? And you you become persona non grata really quick if people perceive you to be standing in the way of affordable housing. So it's been very interesting to talk to him about that and how if you've got one of those and you have a good relationship with the city, that they part the Red Sea for you. They, yeah. they, they want to be seen as enabling that. So aligning yourself with the city, knowing Sometimes that's a lot more possible and other times you're going to barely be able to align with them. But yeah, that's interesting. You yeah. have to keep us updated on that. Yeah, Honolulu. it's exciting. It's um, yeah, I, I started learning about affordable housing in a, in my uh, grad program thing that I'm in and how it works. And the, the impression that I was left with was, wow, there's just not nearly as much profit in affordable housing, but wow, is there consistency? Yeah. Cause there's never not a need yeah. for that kind of stuff. But I think what we're really saying here is how do you know what to build? Well, you know what the market wants. You have to bring that in alignment with what the city will allow. And some people are good at that and some are not. Yeah. Can you think of any, I talked about the shaft liner. Any other deal breakers in your opinion? Yeah, I think it gets very specific. So we could talk about floor plans and, and what goes in a single family home, town home, condo, which is fun. We've done about that. We've done yeah. that before, I think. Yeah, like upgrades and things. Yeah. One thing that comes to mind is just specific on the location. So if you're in Arizona, you have a for rent community, no matter what the product type is. What if you don't have a pool? You're probably your rents are probably gonna be lower, right? To get that thing leased up. Maybe a hundred and fifty to two hundred dollars per unit. Yeah. So I was looking at a uh project down there. I think it had like 91 townhome units off of 91st and Lower Buckeye, if you remember that one. Yep. And the one that was really hurting on that project, it looked great. It's a bunch of townhomes, um, two-story, great layout. The thing I didn't like is that community didn't have a clubhouse or a pool. 
Mm-hmm. And so as I, was, as I was doing a little bit of homework, flew down there, popped into a couple of communities that were close by, and one of them was a Christopher Todd community. And that's what you want to do is just pick the brain and see what's going on in that community or pick the brain of someone with the boots on the ground. Yeah. And I talked with one of the property managers there in that community because they had a nice pool. They had a clubhouse that wasn't huge. They don't have a, they didn't have a workout facility, but they had a clubhouse that had a leasing office in it, but they had that pool and they had that grass or turf right behind the pool, a nice little gathering area. So they had something there for that renter, that tenant and that single family home yeah. for rent community. Yeah. And I asked the lady, I said, Hey, what if I was looking at a community that didn't have a pool? How's that going to affect the rents? And she said, oh, at least 150 yeah. to 200 per unit, maybe more. That's Phoenix, Arizona. So if you go somewhere cold, like maybe here, nah, we'd still want a pool, or Idaho, where it's a little colder, it might not be as needed, but we're talking Phoenix, Arizona. So that's yeah. why I say it's, it's pretty specific. We're talking about layouts and floor plan. We're talking about the layout of the community and the amenities within that community and, mm-hmm. and what's needed. The other thing that comes to mind is we talked about gyms a little bit and how those aren't really needed unless you do it correctly and it's a big, nice A-class gym. Then you might have tenants that go and use that. Yeah. But does it make sense to put in that small, dinky, or the nice gym if you have a nice <laughs> workout facility close by, like a Planet Fitness or a Gold yeah. Gym, you know what I mean? So just... Yeah. Understand your surroundings when you're when you're doing a build for rent community, or if you're looking to invest in one. Understand the amenities that's given. I I kind of feel that people are wanting that space right now. <coughs> one of the reasons why they want that space is because they're not purchasing homes, and that's what we're reading in this mm-hmm. article. And they're looking to work from home, right? So they want that put that desk in that extra room or yeah. in the yeah. hallway. We've talked about that. But I just kind of feel like my prediction, and this that could be totally off, I think they're going to want, and maybe this is going to be the Gen Z millennials or whoever starts to rent in the next five to 10 years. We need to really understand that personality type. But from my understanding, and the little digging that I've done, you're going to have that group, if and when they do rent, they're going to want smaller space. They're going to want to save the money so they can take their money and do things recreational. Mm-hmm. Is, is what I'm feeling. Yeah. So as long as they get just enough space to live, maybe they put a desk on a wall somewhere. It doesn't have to be huge, like a huge single family home. And then they're going to want to pay lower rent if that space allows them to. And they're going to want to just travel. And just go take go that hiking, money. Hiking, yeah. biking. They're just, yeah. get out and do things. Sure. Uh, two. We could see something like that. Two thoughts, Yeah. I mean, it, it remains to be seen like these people, these tenants, you know, they, they want the big, nice gym and the pool. Even if it's in Boise or Utah, there's four or five months you can swim. They want that. They want that gym and they'll pay for it. And they probably hardly ever use it. <laughs> That's the thing. I did um funny story from the land of build for rent. I was talking to Lisa, our property manager. I think you heard this story in, in uh, Arizona and, uh, Homeless guy went for a swim in our pool the other day. Oh, yeah. I didn't hear that one. Uh huh. Yeah, this is a community that's uh, probably half built, half rented, and still under construction. And so she's kind of working in a in a leasing office and in a construction zone at the same time. But yeah, guy went for a swim. <laughs> I don't know what you do about that. Was he the only one swimming down there right now? I bet they're still in the fifties and sixties, aren't they? Yeah. Well, no, they're probably in the seventies. But yeah. you know. Yeah, all those tenants are paying for the pool, but the homeless guy is the only one using it. So maybe that underscores the point. Yeah. It, it's funny, though. You said something I think is really valuable um, about talking to that leasing agent. If you're doing a big build for rent project, five minutes with two or three leasing agents at nearby competing properties is worth more than six months on CoStar. Yeah. I mean, the, the little nuggets that they tell you yep. about the market and what you should do, that's invaluable. Chase and I will be in Phoenix next week doing site visits, looking at some dirt, walking nearby competing properties to get our arms around yeah. um, uh, the the rents and what we need. And and then you said another thing that was kind of what I said earlier, uh, that site on uh, Buckeye, on uh, Lower Buckeye, uh-huh. and the, how the site didn't have a, a pool. 
you got to be involved with this planning from the beginning because you got given that site. It was a bad site design. Yeah. And so you, you can't be afraid to walk away from those sites. And we've done our, we've done a few that I don't like. Yeah. And, and you know, I knew at the time, didn't understand, look back on it now and go, wow, there's a lot I'd change. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I can't remember the other thing that I was going to say, but, uh, but no, I, yeah. it's doing your homework beforehand, understanding what's there. Yeah. And here's the other kicker though, because some great projects or your better deals are getting in early, like maybe in a city that's not quite developed. Yeah. So if that's the case and you don't really understand or, or if there's nothing really surrounding you quite yet, take it a step further. Yeah. Go to the city and understand what's being zoned around you and what's going to be coming in. Okay. So that reminded me of what I wanted to say Perfect. that gels with your, your planet fitness comment, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, just so listeners have, this is some real world uh, application to this. I've talked a number of times on the show about a community I'm doing in uh, Indiana. And what's great about this community is we're in a tight partnership with the city on it. And the Eastern side of the community fronts this new water park that the city is putting in splash pads, some slides, a big pool. And we have an entry from our community into that amenity. And when you go into that um, water park, you can hang a left. And now you're in the parking lot of their new community center, which has a huge gym, big, with a couple of pickleball courts in it. And so I'll be meeting, and, and we've already had preliminary discussions with the city about this. I'll be meeting with them and our HOA management people we're going to add in our HOA budget a certain amount per door that automatically gets paid to the community center. And every single tenant in our project has access to the pool and the water park, as well as all the gym and fitness equipment. So I would be stupid to do a big gym and pool and in, in yeah. mind. I've already got it. I can already benefit from it. So in that case, I had a little bit of a skinnier site plan. We're 135 units, I believe at that site. And so what kind of partnerships are there that would avoid you having to deal with this kind of stuff? Is that, is that possible? So yeah, something to consider. Yeah. That's a good thought. Yeah. That'll be fun. Yeah. Yeah. It'll look, it'll, it'll look good. Those people in there playing pickleball inside. I mean, it's like zero degrees in Indiana right now. Yeah. So, so it's all indoor. That's what you're yeah. saying. No, that's yeah. Nice. Be and when nice. they finish yeah. the construction, they're going to have a couple of outdoors. So yeah. I love it because it's just pushed, 10 bucks a month onto the HOA per door budget, you have none of that maintenance. So how long has that community been there? Are Which, the city or? The one that you're talking about with the indoor pickleball. The community center is like 18 months old. Okay, so. See, yeah. that's why it's good to understand what's there mm -hmm. when you're doing stuff and, or mm -hmm. what's going in. Like, what if you were, what if it wasn't in yet, but it's going in? Right. So you want to plan for those things. Right. So yeah, it doesn't make sense to put in for yeah. pickleball or even any pickleball either get more density or have a more open layout within your, your project or more green yeah. space. Do you like pickleball? Yeah. I bought a $200 paddle. <laughs> Haven't used it once. <laughs> no one invites me to play. I guess they're intimidated by my oh, paddle. I like, did. I have a pickleball court at my house in the backyard. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's got rain and snow on it right now, but when it warms up, you're going to come over and play. Okay. I we'll didn't play. play a ton last year. Yeah. Going through some things, but this year, it's oh, pretty fun. Yeah. Oh, I've heard a lot of these NBA guys are having, they're doing pickleball teams. Yeah. Yeah. They're, yeah. they're uh, supporting um, professional pickleball. Professional pickleball. Yeah. They're buying teams. <laughs> I think Tom Brady did one. Yeah. LeBron James. Wow. I heard. Yeah. Should I lend them my paddle or do you think they have their own $200 paddles? Maybe if you get good enough, you'll, you can make a squad and be a pro. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'll sign off the show one day and say, I got a, a pickleball sponsorship. I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Never know. Yeah. Never know. Cool. Anything else on your mind? I think it's a good discussion today. No, nothing else um, that I can think of. I think we hit some good, yeah. good key points. Yeah. I mean, if anything, the, the hardest part about development and rentals is that you, you make these decisions and they unfold over time. You yeah. got to update your pro formas, your, your financial models, because- these facts that you use, you have to know what's coming. Yeah. Like you said, you have to know yeah. what's coming. So I think the key takeaway today is, is we've talked about the single family home for rent. Yeah. And so that's really big right now. It'll be interesting to see where it goes mm -hmm. over the next three to six to nine months. And if it stays that way. 
So let's keep an eye on it. I think these guys that do the single family detached secretly are hoping at some point they can divide those parcels and sell them off as single family homes at the top of the market. I think. If you zone it correctly, yeah. and depending on the, the city, I've seen that done before. And I've also seen it done with uh, apartment complexes yeah. where they'll Condo go Condo conversions. In. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, you just got to But it's sure. a gamble. It's how do I know they're going to allow me to subdivide this? Yeah. And it's got to be the right... Um, it's got to be built right when doing that, when you go to do it down the road. But go, it, it probably seems like going the other direction would be easier. You know, traditionally cities, I don't want rentals, right? Um, did I tell you the funny quote my buddy heard in an eviction hearing once? Um, oh, no, it wasn't an eviction hearing. It was an approval for a, a, a rental uh, apartment complex. And one of the residents got up and said, hey, look, we don't we don't want this, you know. Not all, not all renters are criminals, but all criminals are renters. <laughs> That's what he said. And uh, it was like, is there some uncomfortable truth to that? But no, I know a couple criminals that own their home. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That's another topic. I was going to start <laughs> rambling about the conversion stuff, but. Maybe we ought to get into that. Like, yeah, yeah this um, condo conversion, because going the other way from this is a rental community to I'm going to chop it up and sell it. Yeah. And you've got more homeowners coming in. I mean, if I know city councils at all, they probably like that more than going the other way. Yeah. Is where it gets hard. Yeah. And I won't go too deep on it is I think it's going to be easier for single family homes to do that and townhome style. The apartment condo gets tricky. Yeah. Depend on how it was zoned because of the land. Who owns the land beneath that building? Mm -hmm. It's usually easier with the single family home because that's where the single family home hits and the townhome, the land, the land beneath it. But who owns the land beneath that condo on the fourth level. The association does. Yeah. So you have to go back and restructure that. Yeah. We can talk yeah. about that later, yep. but that's yep. where it gets tricky. True. Well, thanks a lot, everybody. We appreciate you listening and watching the show. Please subscribe on, um, what do I say? iTunes and Spotify and yep. wherever you get your podcasts. That's what podcast people say. So I say it now too. We'll see you next, uh, next time on the build to rent show. Thanks for listening to the build to rent podcast. You are now just a few clicks away from joining our community of Build to Rent investors. All you have to do is follow our show on Facebook, LinkedIn, or wherever you're listening to this podcast. You can also watch this episode and more by subscribing to the Build to Rent podcast on YouTube. The information presented in this podcast is general in nature. Nothing in this presentation should be construed as financial advice or recommendations for any particular situation. The hosts are only licensed to provide advice and services in the states where they are specifically licensed. And listeners should seek the advice from an appropriately licensed professional in the area where they invest. The examples presented in this presentation are for illustration only, and no guarantee that similar results can be achieved, since the facts, circumstances, and participants are all different.